also actually provide this value added meaning for children. Children who are terrorized at home or at school, children who are bullied, children who are humiliated and embarrassed in the classroom because they don't know enough or they're always having the wrong answer or they always give them fall or whatever it is. Um, they, they sustain long-term damage and they can't learn. You can't learn in an environment that is high stress and punitive and judgmental and hostile. So, restorative justice, what I learned from this was you focus on not just the law that's broken or the rule that's broken, but you focus on the relationship. Classrooms are about relationships, as every place else is. And if you don't have a relationship with that child, that child is going to find it difficult to learn. Great relationships break down between teachers and students and between students. And that affects the learning environment. So you focus on the relationship aspects of what has gone wrong. And, ding, 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 how to repair the harm. Very common sense, very logical. You know, when we were playing ball at home and somebody accidentally threw the ball through the neighbor's window, your parents might trot you over there and say, you have to apologize to Mrs. Jones for breaking her window. And you have to save your babysitting money and repair the window, right? I mean, that's something that's also in our cultural heritage. And that's what this is really trying to do. How we work together, everybody participates in, in resolving the problem. It's not done to somebody else. And it focuses on repair of the home, repair of the relationship, restoring the child, the person, the relationship, the learning environment, and it's a teachable one. So, there was a teacher who, um, this is a true story, not my own, had a student in her class named Jeremy, and every time she would start a new unit or a lesson, he would act out. He'd mouth off, he'd stand up, he'd goof around, he'd throw something, he'd make a scene. Okay, now, what are some ideas you have about what to do about Jeremy? I mean, what would you do with a child like that? What are some ideas? Well, you know, I think, I don't have that detail written down, but I think upper elementary, let's say he's a fifth or sixth grade. So what might you, what are some things that teachers do in cases like that? <laughs> Move to the front of the class. Call the parents. Send them to the office. Yep. Okay, about things we want them to do? Or or just, like, just in general? Well, just what are things people do or, or that you would want to do? I mean, any, anything. So take them to the side. Okay, take them, yeah. take them aside. Not in the classroom. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was going before and started a new <laughs> <laughs> Timing is important. Well, what this teacher did was to pull him aside, as you, I mean, it's suggested. She decided, she, she had been to a restorative justice workshop, and she's very skeptical about the whole thing. So she wanted to prove that it didn't work. <laughs> so she decided, okay, we're going to try this out just to show that it's, you know, a waste of time. <laughs> so she approached Jeremy and she asked if he would be willing to talk to her so that together they could work on their problem. Notice how it was framed. Our mutual problem. So that was a big leap for her. And then, as I got to talking, um, what she learned from Jeremy was, first of all, English was not his first language. And 
he could not follow. She went so fast, he felt, that he couldn't keep up. And so what he was doing was trying to slow her down. If he, if he goofed around, it slowed her down and he had half a chance to find out what she was trying to teach. Well, she was shocked, utterly, completely shocked. And she had a chance also to tell him that when she starts a unit and he makes noise and moves around, it throws her off. And she's trying to focus and concentrate, and then she can't remember what she was going to say. And she felt disrespected, you know, because she worked hard to prepare that unit. And then she wasn't getting a chance to really bring her best self to them. Well, they worked out a plan. The plan was that they, they developed a signal. I don't know what it was, but, you know, Carol Burnett or whatever. Some kind of a signal that he was going to give to her if she was going too fast. And then she would make a decision if she had the time to slow down and repeat, she would. And if she didn't, she had a signal back, which meant, I'll meet with you later and we'll go over this. But before they did that, they both went to the class and they apologized to the class <laughs> for having disturbed the classroom, his having disturbed the classroom, and taking time, you know, away from other kids' learning. And she apologized also for not being in tune with what the needs of her students were. Kind of a radical concept, isn't it? So, how do we apply restorative justice to classroom? First of all, we have to know the paradigm. We have to really get it in our bones that it's possible to rethink and to reframe what we do in the classroom. Um, I'm trying to summarize some of these principles and how they apply to the classroom. So, and this is, you know, abstraction here, but I think it's good to try to nail it down. So let's just, it's, let's just go through this, just as a way of reinforcing this whole notion of what a restorative environment is like. So principle one is um, that the restorative learning environment we view acting on behavior primarily as a violation of one's relationship with oneself and other groups others. In other words, again, the relationship. And secondarily, as a violation of rules. We appeal to the rules because it's easier. But why do we create rules in the first place? To create a conducive learning environment, to keep people safe. It's all about people, their safety, their well-being, and their relationships. That's the purpose of rules. So what restorative justice really does is it pushes us to go to the foundation of why we do this. And not just do the lazy thing, well, it's a rule. <laughs> That's why. Do it because I say so, or because it's a rule. You know how well that sentence goes over. <laughs> not so well. Number two, um, we recognize both the opportunity and the danger created by acting out behavior. So as soon as, as the safety concerns are addressed, the problem is utilized as a teachable moment. And then three. Handle problems at the earliest opportunity and use a cooperative process directly between the ones involved. So engage the people who are involved directly. Um, so, and this could be other students, this could be teachers, parents, administrators, you know, whoever the relevant people are who's involved in this. I mean, in the Jeremy case, it was really an issue between the two of them, but then they did include the classroom in knowing what had been done. So there was a role for the classroom as well. Um, four, since the goal is to restore and preserve relationships, those who have violated relationships are invited to repair them and them, to make things as right as possible. And then five, what, what about a cooperative process? How do we do that? So first we try to create a safe space together 
by establishing some guidelines for conversation. And there are different ways to do that. If I had more time, I'd go into it. But